who um, is based down in Australia, but unfortunately Mick um, couldn't couldn't make the session. So um, after the recent Biz Talk Summit, um, everybody was really excited about the um, the session Oliver Davy and I did from uh, Northumbria University, and we were a little bit tight for time at the summit. So I kind of thought um, it might be a good opportunity to have a little bit bit sort of deeper dive on that demo that we did and also kind of revisit some of the architecture stuff we were talking about. And um, what I'm going to do in this session is, it's, it's obviously, I, I only made the decision a few days back to, to do this session. So I'm going to revisit some of the slides we covered and then kind of do it as a bit more of a show and tell type of thing. And um, I have a whole list of stuff on my whiteboard I want to walk through with you guys. But really, um, I want to make this sort of interactive if possible. So if there's any bits that you guys Want to, want to know a little bit more about if you just pipe up with some questions um, and I'll kind of see if I can dive as, as deep as you guys want me to about the demo. Um, so just to begin with, um, firstly check out the new picture that Sriram's put on my on my lovely slide here. So Integration Monday t-shirts we had at the summit and uh, I think we managed to get about 20 people with them which was pretty cool. Now we haven't, uh, we had this idea about having a shop but we found Teespring wasn't quite as cool as what we thought it was. So if anybody wants to get their own Integration Monday t-shirt for any events that you're going to, just use the design there, but everybody feel free to get your own. Um, and it just makes it easier than trying to centrally organize that. Um, so if we have a quick flick through the slides then. So at the summit, um, if you all remember that Oliver did this fantastic speech about um, you know, that this idea of why integration was important to the university and um, also why the you know the whole industry sector was about to change and become competitive and how the university kind of viewed integration as an enabler to kind of make them stand out in that in that particular sector and you know I thought he did a really great job and and it really you know before I even started telling you guys um, about about what you know what the detail of the session was. He kind of, in my eyes, when I looked out to the audience, everybody was looking back, going, "God, I really want to be on that team." It sounds like they're the kind of customer that an integration guy would want to work for. So that that was a you know that kind of set me up to need to do something a bit special. And the idea was we wanted to look at um, you know an integration architecture that could support those business aims. Grabbing a couple of slides out the deck last week, so we we thought about what would make us successful, and the idea was things like agility and the ability to do just-in-time integration was one of those really important things. So, you know, in, in the modern world, we don't get six months, twelve months to deliver an integration project. We need to be able to turn these things around quickly, but at the same time, we need to build them in a way that's robust and reliable. But sometimes we may sacrifice a little bit of that robustness to be able to deliver the requirement in time. But the idea was if we build this platform that can evolve as we go using various parts of the Microsoft integration stack and then building upon that platform will let us deliver um, integration solutions that can meet this two-speed IT pattern that we see today so where sometimes we're prepared for it to take longer and cost more because we need it to, whereas other times we just need those quick wins and it's about being able to deliver against both. Now, when I started talking about the architecture stuff, um, the idea was to talk a little bit about some of the problems that I see in the industry and, and what, to me, what's happened over the last few sort of years, decades, whatever, however length the time you want to talk about. Um, we saw these different industry commentators where they'd kind of just redirect the entire ship of what integration was about. So we had guys who would say, well, you know, one minute ESB is the new silver bullet and everything would be solved by an ESB. And then we had people who go, went, well, you know, actually SOA is the new thing and we need to build every integration solution using SOA. And then we had um, the API economy, which dealt with all the problems that SOA had and magically made integration easy. And we've seen this kind of theme over and over again with the, the more recent ones being things like microservices and no ESB being the new paradigms that everybody's talking about. But the reality is that, you know, we, we kind of, um, well, this slide was quite an interesting one where, you know, the, the problems we've had in the integration space that we've had 20, 30, 40 years ago, the whole ETL batch mainframe type stuff, 
that still exists today. It's you know we might not do it as much as we used to, but we still have to deal with that. At the same time, we've got things that have evolved a few decades ago now, where we had EDI and EAI kind of came to prominence, followed by XML web services, ESB, SOA, and we, and we go through this whole list of of different architectural shifts and as we get to the more modern ones you know this whole lightweight integration but also we've got this this massive scale to deal with and the key thing here is that if you think of where we are today we actually have to deal with all of these things it's not really as if anything's replaced something else it's just we've got new problems and we need new types of solution to solve those problems but we still have old things to deal with as well and that really led us to think you know, we've we've got this one angle of change around architecture, but we also have technology changes as well. So we had this idea that um, you know, 2009 we had things like BizTalk and SQL Server integration formed the heart of our integration capability, and they, that was the kind of core of our toolbox alongside web services. <clears throat> and then I talked about these slides where, as we got into the cloud space. But there was new things coming along. We had some new server technologies, but we started to have this emerging kind of cloud capability for integration. And we, we started talking about iPaaS as a sort of cloud paradigm. And then as as technology grew, you know, we, we started having more things appearing in the Azure space and the toolbox growing and growing. And today we've we've got something that looks a little bit like this where, you know, th this was me thinking about in last year, what are all the different technologies that I've either been asked about by a customer that I've used or that I've had to research um, to understand where they fit in the integration toolkit. So that that's a pretty big set of tools now, but the, the key thing is that they don't all do the same job. There's bits of overlap here and there, but it's you know it's nice to have this really rich toolkit where I can choose the right tool for the right job and not have to choose you know my big sledgehammer to solve every single problem, even if it, if it's you know could be done in a much simpler way. So we're in a good place now, but actually, if you also look at other vendors in the marketplace, a lot of vendors like IBM and Oracle have had many different integration technologies in their product suite for a long time. It's really that Microsoft had sort of, you know, really just a few things, but that's now grown. So when we talked about this, this two angles of change, we then came to our conceptual platform and, for those who might not have seen the summit um, presentation by the Minecraft stuff's come, just bear with me while I set the scene a little bit. But uh, we just want to explain the, the background to how we get to to where we um, start doing the fun stuff. So the idea, um, if we think about our architecture that we want to build as an integration platform, starting at the highest conceptual level, um, what I really wanted to think about was this idea that EAI, ESB, and a services slash API, um, kind of those three paradigms of architecture working together in tandem can actually be at the heart of our integration platform. And um, you know, the, and to me, it's it's about us working together and using the right bit in the right place, rather than thinking about those as competing architecture styles, which is the way a lot of industry commentators have pitched those. Now. When we get um, when we get a bit more into the, the different um, sort of principles within our integration platform, one of the things that I wanted to talk a little bit about as well was this idea of integration as microservices, which was something that came up with the Integrate Summit. And what I'm kind of saying here is that that integration as microservices isn't necessarily the same as building an application with microservices. Think of microservices as really an approach to how you're going to build something, and we wanted to take those principles that people were talking about in the microservices space and apply them to integration. <clears throat> so when I did all my research around um, what microservices was, how people were building this stuff, and I realised that actually a lot of the principles that are here, you know, we've been using them for a few years anyway and just not calling them microservices. And we, we hadn't maybe used all of the principles, but some of them we had. And what I found in the microservices space was there was a couple of gaps. So number one, when people are about microservices, they're not really talking about how cross-application integration works. They're only really thinking about inside their app domain. So if I've got a monolithic application and a microservices-based application, how does that work? 
and also when we've got our microservices that are talking to each other, um, you know, we, we're not really getting the guidance yet around how they should should communicate with each other, and that concerned me a little bit that that could end up being, you know, a feature type of new integration spaghetti. And um, you know, when you read the, the guidance on it, I've, I've only really seen stuff that talks about, you know, in, in very simplistic terms of use AMQP or use HTTP to do your communications, but to me, there's a little bit more to it than that. But that said, um, to me, in an integration space, there's a lot of the principles that, that are talked about in the microservices world that can apply very well to an integration platform. So some of those would include things like, um, you know, building applications with small code bases rather than big monolithic ones. Now, you know, if you're a BizTalk developer and you've gone into a customer site, I bet nearly everybody has gone in and seen the one Visual Studio solution that has every single thing in it, and that's one of my, you know, that that's one of my biggest hates on a BizTalk project is those massive, massive code bases that just don't need to be. But also other things we could take from microservices is the ability to deploy things in isolation, and we can kind of create things as almost like building blocks that work work together to deliver a solution rather than everything in one package. And you know, there's a few other things on the slide there, but the key point is that there's some good things we can take from microservices to help us build integration solutions in a better way. And how I pitched this um, at the summit was the idea that, well, an integration team often gets viewed by teams on your project as being like, like this little tugboat that's trying to maneuver a massive ship. And they view integration as being slow and difficult to make happen and, you know, just, just you know, we, we get viewed as being a, a roadblock really in a lot of projects. And my idea was to pitch it well, if we've got an integration platform that's built in an agile manner using some of the principles of microservices, we can actually change this to be a, more represented by something like an aircraft carrier where we've got this, you know, kind of heavy, robust platform when we need it. But we've also got these jet fighters that we can send out to deal with specific requirements. And they, they, could become representative of what, what our microservices could be. And the idea was that if we if we make our microservices work well together, then they could become more agile and deliver stuff as a team, a bit like maybe a Red Arrows kind of scenario. Now, a couple of slides I didn't talk about at the summit because we just didn't have time was this idea of polymorphic services. So one of the things that's the important to the agility that I want to have in our in our um, integration platform is the idea that I can build some kind of integration feature in a service but move it without it being a big deal. So the idea here is if you think of your architecture and if I said I've got a feature that does something like an update of a customer, if I wanted to move that to another service container, how big would the impact be across your architecture? So I want that impact to be very small and manageable, but I think a lot of the times you'll find that the impact would be very big or even difficult to quantify. And I'll show a representation of that. So if you imagine here, we've got um, a customer service component down at the bottom, and it's got a couple of features in it. So one of them's called Update Customer, and we've also got another feature that's a specialization of it called Update USA Customer. And what kind of happens is we get messages go through our service virtualization engine and route to that customer service component. Now, what I'd want to be able to do in the architecture is say, well, for some reason, this update USA customer needs to be moved. So the reasons we might move it could be that we want better performance, we need to implement it in a different way. Um, perhaps we decide that, that that piece changes quite often or has an associated amount of risk with it. So we want to isolate that into a new a new component. And if you think back, you know, non-integration are just our basic development principles of things like isolate what changes. That's, you know, something we can implement with this polymorphic pattern here. So what I might do is I might spin up a new service container, shift across my update customer um, feature, and then I can reroute my message and have that handled on its own. And if I wanted to move things in the architecture, I don't want it to be difficult to do. So now let's um, let's have a little bit of a step down and look at the logical platform. So if we think um, in the logical platform here, I've got this um, this sort of idea of a few of my um, 
a few of my applications at the top that are consumers of services and a few of my applications at the bottom that may be cloud, may be on premise that are um, that are kind of like um, you know the sort of providers of um, functionality or data. And the idea is in the integration platform. Sorry, I've just lost my mouse there. To create some application connector services as we begin to logically build up what's in the platform. And later on, I'm going to apply some technologies on top of this. But at the moment, if you just think of these as logical types of component, so we've got these things that can connect to applications. On top of that, we've got some business process logic type services. Then in the middle, we've got our integration infrastructure. So we might have things like a service virtualization engine some kind of ESB, some kind of EAI type capability and various security and utility type functions. Above that, we've got um, service gateway type components and these are really about um, extending the, exposing the platform to somebody outside of it. Uh, and above, we might have some kind of API management feature which sort of supercharges those gateways so we can maybe offer like a developer community around them. Now. Those are just the definitions I've given for the logical components, but you could also maybe think of the application connector or the service gateway as being an adapter, possibly. It really, you know, really just depends what what protocol your application is talking. But in the language we're using in the university, these are the kind of components that we're talking about at this logical level. Physically, they could be implemented in different ways. Now. The next bit's really about the containers. So in, in the diagram previously, we've got these different types of components, but they could live in different service containers. So maybe on-premise or as a structure in the cloud, we might have things hosted in IAS. We might have um, Windows services or possibly BizTalk. We could have um, cloud platform as a service. We could deploy stuff as websites, web roles, worker roles, web jobs. And in the future, we view some of the containers will be using as being things like logic apps, API apps, or possibly Docker down the line. Now, these are just various places we could deploy those kind of logical components to. And one of the things I've added to the slide deck since Integrate is this idea of the hexagonal view that Charles Young was talking about. And I really like the way he um, he explained that. And I kind of tried to explain the you know, a bit of a join up between the stuff I was talking about and the stuff Charles was talking about. So Charles um, had this idea of integration inside a hexagon and the white lines are really important boundary here. This was the, the boundary between what is integration um, domain stuff and WhatsApp domain stuff. And within that, um, Charles really just talked about microservices within inside, inside the hexagon. But what I want to do is really say, well, look, inside here, We've got this infrastructure, which is our integration platform. So we've got our, you know, the things in the middle for the ESB, AI, and service virtualization capability, and that really lets whatever it is in the in the integration platform work together. But then on top of that, we've got um, the gateways. So we have our app connector gateways being these little blue boxes, and that will be for the integration platform to talk out to an application. So maybe it's like an adapter pattern or an on-ramp, uh, sorry, an off-ramp type pattern. As well as that, we've got our service gateway or our on-ramp patterns where an application can talk to the integration platform. And then within the center of that um, that hexagonal architecture, we now overlay our, um, our microservice style implementations on top of here so we can put our lightweight business services or any lightweight integration services make these work together within the platform. But the idea that things that want to talk to these would come in through the through the on-ramp, off-ramp style pattern. Now, one of the things that came up quite uh, commonly at the, um, at the summit was this, and it's come up on Integration Monday a few times, of this idea about resource architecture versus messaging architecture or potentially REST versus SOAP stuff. And everybody always goes, I'm mentioning it, but I want to avoid talking about it because it's it's obviously quite a delicate subject and, and some people are very passionate about it. So what I wanted to do is really, really just jump in feet first. You know, I, I kind of often do that kind of thing. And just really state where our position is on this. So 
the idea is we like rest we like soap we like messaging we like resources i don't particularly have a preference of one versus the other but the key thing is that as an integration guy we need to be able to use all of these and use them all in an effective way now for our integration pla uh, platform inside the platform in this in this red um, area here we prefer to use a messaging style architecture because the concept of a resource isn't necessarily a, a physical thing it might be more of a logical thing and um, it, you know if, if we think about typical rest services it can be really difficult to make these things kind of um, chained together to, to implement a process so it becomes much easier if you want to pass messages between them um, instead because that means we can do the polymorphic behavior where I can have two services that look the same and just reroute a message between them that becomes a lot more difficult with rest um, that said on the outside so as we cross that white line between the integration domain and the app domain there'll be certain scenarios where rest would be a really good fit so for example if I'm talking to something with a rest API that's an obvious candidate but also in the demo you'll see later um, for Minecraft it's really easy to a REST API that Minecraft can consume and that's where um, that's where our thinking is the best fit for a traditional REST style approach um, in the middle just because I say messaging I've put that in in brackets because or in quotes because by messaging I don't necessarily just mean queues we've got this idea of any message over any channel so I want to be able to flow a message through BizTalk through service bus through a an HTTP call or HTTP wrapped in SOAP and kind of just pass any message over and let the let the endpoint handle the message and you know it either it either handles it or it doesn't but it's just got this one interface that I can chuck any message at now if that's something people would like to know a little bit more about later in the session if you let if you just pop a comment in and I can elaborate on it but for now I'll kind of hang fire at that so next level was the physical platform and if we sort of jump back a few slides to what logical diagram looked like and we start overlaying technology on it now so we started off by going um, the app connector layer we can either use things like BizTalk and Azure API app or some kind of REST or uh, WCF service to talk to an outside application on top of that we've got our business services so we might choose to implement these in BizTalk in a logic app in a custom um, service of some kind we've then got our infrastructure pieces so service virtualization we might use Sentinet um, we might use service bus for our ESB and BizTalk for our EAI bit if you notice that some of these products can actually play multiple roles here just depending on what features they've got then at the service gateway level we might have um, something like a you know the Nazir website and a REST service or we might have um, Sentinet can offer up an, an external end. I, I guess I should have put BizTalk there as well if I offer a BizTalk adapter to somebody outside the platform. And then if we choose to put API management on top of that, we've, we've obviously got Azure API management as well that we can use. And hopefully that kind of starts overlaying technology on top of capabilities. So hopefully that kind of makes sense as what an integration platform can begin to look like. now. For the university, what we were saying is that we didn't necessarily want to go and build everything straight away before we really had any requirements, but we wanted this this kind of picture in our head about what it would look like, and we can evolve it over time. So we might start with some custom stuff, and then we might add biz talk, and then we we might add sent in it later. And in the demo, I want to try and show a little bit of each of this kind of thing. So. That's the, the background. Um, I hope everybody followed that okay. And now we're going to jump into the demo. So for the demo, um, the the idea was, um, you know, every of oh, I'm going to say every integration demo because that's that's quite insulting to some really good demos that I've seen. But as a general rule, integration demos are a bit boring. <laughs> is, it, is that fair to say? Maybe not. Um, but the idea was that you know, whenever I've done pre-sales in the past it's really difficult to do a demo to a customer that looks quite cool and really showcases um, what integration can do now what I wanted to do is kind of create something that looked really cool but actually said look if you look under the hood here there's some really powerful stuff going on that makes that look awesome 
it looks pretty cool anyway but it, you know adding minecraft on top of it was just a, a really interesting way to drive the platform and i guess um what we wanted to do was to have this idea of a of a business story that we could that kind of made sense as well so we came up with this idea of minecraft university and what we wanted to do is just see whether we could use minecraft to model some of the business processes and some of the business ideas inside minecraft but integrate them into the um, integration platform and there's a couple of angles to this so number one if um if minecraft can leverage the integration platform then it can't be that difficult to plug most things into it really maybe you know um i'm not saying that there's not going to be challenges somewhere but um you know as a general rule minecraft you know if you plug that in it shouldn't be too difficult but also it gives me something really cool to demo people about and get people to buy into the the ideas that we're talking about so if we um think of some of the scenarios i wanted to cover so i guess we've got um two or three example scenarios so the first one is the idea where we have this project where they're doing um door act or security access to doors around the around campus and what they wanted to do was to be able to hook into active directory um when people swipe cards to access a door and, and check some like groups and stuff like that before you're granted access now we can kind of model that in minecraft so that was one of the first um the first fun demos i came up with and the next one was really um about the enrollment for a course so if i want to enroll for a course and go through an approval process and, and you know they just started giving us the ability to show different kinds of um different business processes sort of simulated with minecraft um so if we start thinking about the first one then so what i'm going to do here if you imagine i've got my authentication service that is a custom service we've put on top of active directory and we've got this service virtualization component and the problem becomes well minecraft's outside of the corporate domain so how do we how do we kind of hook these things together so what i did was um, used azure service bus relay and we had a an api um, it hosted an Azure that Minecraft would consume. But what we also did was we put Azure API management in front of that, give us this nice rich experience for APIs and Minecraft can hook into that. And once we get through the relay into our virtualization component, we can then send messages through, route them to whatever service we need. And Minecraft can do some quite cool stuff with that. So I'm gonna, excuse me. Um, so I'm going to start off by just showing you what this looks like, and um, and then after I've shown how it works, um, we'll we'll have a little bit of a walkthrough and look at some of the um, some of the things you can do in Minecraft. So here we are. Um, I'll just maximise this a bit. So here we are in Minecraft, and one of the things that I got wrong at the London Summit was I forgot to turn it um, off peaceful mode. So so the fact that I've got a big green thing jumping around in the background means I know I've got it in the right mode now. And I've got a few buildings here that represent different stuff that we've been playing around with as ideas. And one of the ones is this um, this this little room here. Now we use a, um, a feature in Minecraft or a, a mod called ComputerCraft, and that lets us um, write some code to be able to do stuff. And you, you get these all screens here like this one which is called an advanced computer now this room here a um, couple of things to note so firstly the door the silver door is a locked door that you can't just walk through normally when you walk up to the door in minecraft it automatically opens and then shuts again um with this one it's our treasure room so you can only get into the room if you supply the username password and if you just know in the background there the, the light inside the room is turned off so I can click on the terminal and I can run a program called Open Door. Let's see if I can put the right username. You can see that'll take a second or two to go through the relay. I haven't run it for a while, so it's a little bit slow. Now we go access granted. So you can see now if I go in, it's um 
it's fired up this is what's called redstone signal which sends a, like electricity around the room and turns all these lights on and then if i go back out the door because it shuts again after 20 seconds so the door opens again and we can go back out now one of the things we wanted to do was to um, play around with some fun ideas as well so I'm just gonna kill that thing because it's in my way so what about what happens if we try to hack the door we needed some security measures so this was my nine-year-old son's idea was to say well if you, you um, and notice I've got a sword handy just for, for when this happens so if you try to hack the room uh, sorry And I put a bogus password in. You'll see, sorry, you can't come in. And suddenly there's a um, password protector. Zombies appeared who comes and tries to attack you. So I'll just kill him there. And if you notice that the trap door opened underneath, and the idea was that if you try to hack the room, then you either get attacked by the zombie or you fall to your death down the trap door. So I'm just going to, before we take a step further, I'm just going to now turn it on to. Um, peaceful mode because you guys probably won't hear this but when I've got it in um, easy mode there's all this background noise in the headphones so it's quite difficult to concentrate now what I'm going to do next and so we saw that that was the Minecraft bit we could demonstrate that I've ran a program I've added some credentials clicked yes and it and it said you know here we go um, let you know let's make a call out and sort of validate your credentials and I, I got in the door but you don't really you know that I actually didn't do anything um, or I actually did anything there so what I'm going to show you now is um, a little bit of the under the hood stuff so to begin with um, I've got this API in Azure API management and we go quickly to the dashboard so you can see um, as the dashboard comes up you'll see we've just had some calls go through this recently so that would have been me doing various activities there. So what I did with this dashboard is um, one of the quite cool features is I created a REST API, um, which I hosted on the Azure website. So I did that before the new app service stuff came out. So it's just a typical Azure, excuse me, Azure website and put a bunch of um, REST style services here. And a couple of months ago when I did this, the swagger stuff was starting to take off. So the idea was, well, one of the quite cool things is I can put swagger in my API and I can, you know, do all the nice fancy swagger stuff here. I can do a search for some courses, for example. I can try it out and I can get my list of courses back, um, which I'll show you later in the demo. But the idea is that with that API, I can go into API management and from that swagger definition I could just um, import that in and create a new API so that was a pretty cool way of um, getting the API management to just auto generate the scaffolding for my AI within um, the management console for this so I can see I've got all my various operations here and you know if I do like the courses one you can see I'll, I'll have some bits of documentation and stuff like that and you know that kind of um, kind of gives me a good start point but also in the developer portal so I could go and um, expose this now to various types of developers um, so my, my Minecraft development team for example might have access to this and they could go in and you know, if you haven't seen um, Azure API management before maybe check out when the videos come out from the London conference because um, Kent Weir and um, Tommaso did some really good sessions about that and what I could do, for example, on the get courses one is I could open my console and I can go in here and I can have a look at this, um, you know, that this whole get courses method and I can test it out quite easily and stuff. So I can do like a course start with A and it, you know, gives me things like sample code. So, you know, all, all this really good stuff to get you up and running really quickly with an API if you're not familiar with that. Now, under the hood I've got a few um, a few bits and pieces going on so if you imagine at this point we've got um, we've got our APIs that's our service gateway component from the logical um, the logical sort of definition of the platform we've got the service bus relay 
which is what it uses to come on premise and then on prem we've got a couple of things so number one we've got this lightweight um kind of wcf routing style component that that we use that i'll, I'll not dig too much into today but strategically what we're going to do is um we're going to use um sentinet for our service virtualization so if i um if i can show you we've I've got one of the services plugged into that and the others are using the lightweight stuff. So in Sentinet, if, you, if you're not familiar with this, so I think somebody before on the chat kind of mentioned the um, managers, Managed Services Engine, which was a, a quite interesting open source project that started up years ago and then kind of didn't really go anywhere. Well, Sentinet is, is a third party product a bit like if you'd invested in that Managed Services Engine for a few more years and turned it into a real product, you would have ended up with Sentinet. And um, what you can do here is you can kind of define a virtual service, which I've got my my router service here, and then sorry, let me uh, just log in here. Obviously, to build that zombie properly before he's got in and interfering with my yeah uh, my demo here. <laughs> so behind the scenes, I've got. Um, my messaging service, which is what the the on ramp to what my different behind the scenes services is called. So with that, my on ramp, I've got the ability to create that in a REST service as a WCF service, or I can expose that as a talk endpoint if I wanted to. It's just a, a definition of, of what a contract looks like. You can see here I've got um, two implementations of that. So one of them would be my courses service, and one of them is my IT ops service, which I'll talk a little bit about later and what happens is in the router service which is the virtual um, virtual endpoint on top of those physical ones I can go this this kind of life cycle of de developing my service and I can create um, you know like a process and pipeline for it and stuff like that so you can get that to come up so I can create a way of it you know mapping the virtual endpoint the physical endpoint um, we've got this, these things like dependencies, um, and we've got the ability to control access to it, to provide monitoring features on it, and things like that. So I think you'll see in here, you'll have seen some calls go through here. So the idea is that um, under the hood, when we've got our API and services stack going on, we can have, you know, for certain types of services, we'll have a gateway in the cloud comes on premise via the relay into into Sentinet and that can route it to any of our any of our services that are on prem or it can reach out to the cloud again if it needs to. That covers that that first use case. Can somebody just out of curiosity, can somebody um just pop a quick note in that if if I explain that quite well because I want to kind of get it right before we jump a little bit further. So if if, if I didn't make any sense so far. Just pop a note in the chat. Brilliant. Thank you, Carlo. It's quite difficult actually when, when you can't see people's faces to know if you're actually making sense of a total load of rubbish. Right, so um so I quickly check my whiteboard. So we've talked about um, password protected door, swagger, web API. So next let's have a quick look at the Minecraft bit before we delve into any more of the techie stuff. So you notice um, in Minecraft, for those who aren't familiar with it, so I mentioned before we've got this computer craft thing here, this mod, and if you go in, the, if you press the E key and you go in and you've got your kind of inventory, there's this thing here called um, computer craft, which is it's what's, what's called a mod, which is basically like an add-on that gives you extra things to play with. And in computer craft, you get these things called computers, advanced computers, disk drives, printers, modems, and you, you can do all sorts of fantastic stuff with it. But before we get into that, what I really want to sort of talk about is this um, thing called tech uh, technic. So if um, if you've done much Minecraft before, you might be familiar with the idea of um, installing mods. And I, when I first started getting what I just hated whenever AJ wanted to have a mod added to his Minecraft because it was painful to download them. It was a bit of an arse to set them up. And there's this thing called Technic, which is a, it's like a launcher for Minecraft. So what you can do is um, when you start it up, it'll it'll offer you a 
kind of pre-modded version of Minecraft. So there's different flavors of it here. So you can see you've got this one here called Attack of the B Team, which is a version of Minecraft with three or four different mods already installed. Um, and there's a few different ones as you go down the list here. So I'm I'm using this Technic, Laun uh, Technic Launcher for my of Minecraft I'm using here, and I'm basically just using the one with Computer Craft pre-installed, which makes my life a little bit easier. Now, um, after we've after we've done that, we we then need to create um, programs. So if um, if I go into into my um, editor again, so. In Minecraft, you develop a program in a language called Lao, which is which is spelled L-A-U, and it kind of there's two ways you can do it. So the first way is you can go edit and create create a new program called My New Program. Then you can um, do something like print um, print hello, and then I can. Um, save it and then I can exit it and I can go um, run my new program and it'll it'll just print hello so you can kind of edit it in this um, this code editor here but also what you can do is on the um, on the file system you can um, you can go to your app directory Roman technic mod packs and you'll see um, there's a mod pack called computer craft and in here you can go to your save games and then my save game is called London Summit and under here you'll get a folder called computers and you get like, excuse me, one folder for each computer that you build in the game. So I can't remember what the number of that computer is, but to give you an idea, actually, um, computer 2, I've got a program in it to tell me what number it is. So we go in here you'll see um, there's a new file called my new program and I can open that with notepad and then the, the code just looks a bit like that so it's, it's really you know you can edit it in notepad and I can just save it so if I you know if I do um, if I do print to I run my program again, and you can see it's already picking up the changes automatically. So if we if we now have a look in um, on this computer and do the um, open door program, but actually I'll, I'll show you a slightly different one that's better better way of um, so com computer to the the um, the stuff in that one in that program I hadn't learned about the JSON stuff at that point so um, there's a, a bit of a better way to handle JSON um, in here so what I'm kind of doing here is um, in this program I can you can reference the terminal which is the, the monitor that I'll show you in a minute and you can like make it and put stuff onto a monitor as well the key thing is that um, down here I've I've got like a URL and I've got some headers that I can use this HTTP GET or HTTP POST objects, and I can um, get an HTTP response back. And then you'll see um, down here I can do a read line, and then I can do JSON dot decode, which kind of gives me a table. And then over in this bit here, I can kind of loop through the table with this JSON API. So, so let me just show you at the top. There's a couple of um, a couple of like open source um, APIs you can reference them. by API what they mean is it's another text file on the computer with some functions that you can use so I can use this um, this JSON function and down here I can kind of um, reference my response object coming back by a property name so I'm called JSON row dot title and if um, if we look back at the um, API management portal so I think this was the get courses one you can see here I've got a title property on my list of courses and here I can just iterate over that list and I can go dot title dot tutor ID and reference it as if it was like a basic like JavaScript which is quite cool um, now from a Minecraft perspective that that's about as difficult as it gets you know just just working out how to, how to 
process that JSON response coming back and doing an HTTP GET or a POST. So that's pretty easy to call into the platform. And then obviously in Minecraft, there's a load of more complex stuff you can do if you've got um, things going on in your game you want to re interact with. But from an integration perspective, as long as I can call that gateway in the cloud, I can do some quite cool stuff behind the scenes. Now, what I want to do next is um, if I show a couple of the other bits of the demo, and what I'd like to do is just show you what's going on behind the scenes to make those features work. And then there's a couple of features that I couldn't show at the summit because we didn't have time, which I think are quite interesting. And um, I'll, I'm going to show you a little bit about how those work as well. So we, um, we just nip back to the slide for a minute. And so we've done this slide here. So the next, um, the next demo is about the enrollment process. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to be able to be a student in the game, go into the enrollment office, and what I'm going to do is choose a course that I'd like to do and then apply to enroll for it. So the way that's going to work is we're going to use the existing stack we've got in the cloud, and we're going to go through API management through our API, and then we're going to drop a message on a service bus queue in JSON. And that message is going to be picked up by BizTalk, and we're going to use the JSON um, JSON pipeline components to get that into a format BizTalk can work with. And then BizTalk's actually, now what the demo actually does, I guess this is slightly wrong, so I've got BizTalk just using the SQL adapter to go into a couple of databases to look up um, the data for the courses that do the student who I am and, and a few other bits and bobs and then I'm going to create an enrollment in the enrollment system so if we have a little bit of a look um, it kind of works a bit like this where we get the message into biz talk it does some enrichment stuff finally saves it in, in the enrollment system so if I um, right now I'm going to just set um, Back to daytime now. Unfortunately, I don't know the command to um, change the weather. So when it's raining in your demo, it's never a good sign. I guess before we do the enrollment, I'll just show you guys one quite cool thing that we did. So using the same stack as we did for the um, the authentication stuff, and um, we've also got another service in that API that tells me what status various systems in the university are. So if you imagine. I've got some system that tells me whether things are good or not, and I've just hooked in with a small microservice on top of that, so it adapted into my pattern, using it as an app connector component, and then I can thread a message through my entire stack, get that data back, and I can show that here in Minecraft. So this big screen kind of um, just every every few minutes, there you'll see it refreshing. It goes and just checks what the status of all the systems are, so I can tell everything in the university is good at the minute. Now, if anything goes offline, what's quite cool is we um, we ping a firework up into the air. So this this here, this um, funny colored block is called a command block. I'll see if I can show you the code on that. So it's um, it's a bit like I guess it's a bit like um, command line type stuff where um, if that computer detects something's broken, it triggers a redstone signal into that command block that makes this command here execute. But it's a pretty long command um, that tells you, like, tells it what does to be a firework and all that kind of stuff. See so if summon firework entity, blah 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 blah, loads of parameters. Um, and it was just the idea was we can play around by launching a firework if something goes offline. Now, there's um, if you're looking into that stuff, there's a couple of websites that let you work out what the command should be for launching a firework or spawning a zombie or something like that. So you can have a look into those. But the uh, bit we want to look at for now is if we go into the enrollment office and what we want to do, so we've got this big monitor here with nothing on it. We've got a printer to the left. You can see here my tray for the printer's loaded up. And we've got my computer here, so I can go print courses. And I'll have all the courses that start with A. If we check the monitor, we can see here's a list of all the courses that start with A. And the printer now has a pane on the bottom of the array. Let that refresh catch up a bit. So if I go and um, catch the bit of paper out the tray now, 
and I can just have a quick look at that and I can show you here here's a print out of um print out of those courses that we've we've just um, downloaded from the API. So if you're doing some more fancy stuff, what you can do is get the printer to print out a whole bunch of pages. They can bind them together and make a book or something like that if you were doing some fancy thing in the game. But for us, um, we just want to pick a course. So what I'm going to do now then is if um, if I click here and I'll go um, add enrollment, and we'll choose course number eight. But just before we do that, I'll just show you. Um, so we've got a courses system here. We've got a courses database. I'll just check so we haven't got anything in the courses database, nothing up the sleeve. Um, so if we choose course number eight and I supply my username, so it'll say add an enrollment. And if we check for the enrollment, we can see here's some details on the screen. So we, um, we've added a new enrollment for me, and I'll get an email shortly um, just to confirm that I my enrollment's been received. So we go back now um, and have a quick look in the database and we can see here's my new enrollment so we've got me it's new there's some of my deals and stuff and what happened to make that to make that enrollment happen was we used um biz talk so if i quickly go in here and go to my um service instances. I can see these ones have pretty much just happened. So we've got a bunch of um, various instances that have just executed in um, in BizTalk and I'll get my track message events so you can see the most recent ones we had something getting sent out over SMTP um view WCF SQL adapter calls. Um here's our service bus card at the, the bottom here. So in BizTalk what we've got then is um this idea that an, an orchestration with a receive shape and once we kick off the orchestration we've got a parallel activity going on so we'll convert the message to be two queries which will actually go via a SQL adapter into the two databases to pull out what is the details of the student who's applied? What is the details of the course? Because I need those to, to build up the enrollment message. And then uh, as we get further down, we've got this idea where if we run a map to create the enrollment, it'll ping that out to, uh, you know, to the insert enrollment method. That'll again, it just uses, um, just to keep it easy for demo purposes, we just use the SQL adapter and drop it in the database. And at the end, we get this um, email message that we'll send out, and, and hopefully that will all just work. And excuse me, if I check my email now with a bit of luck, you can see. So here's um, here's the email I've just received. So hi, Mike Stevenson. Thank you for rolling in. Is your app service 101? We're reviewing your application, and we'll contact you soon. So we've got our email there. That's looking pretty good. And um, just to have a quick look at the BizTalk config. So one of the things that um, you know it's, it's it's not that complex as BizTalk demos go, but hopefully it it demonstrates something like a real process um, driven by something a bit more fun like Minecraft. But one of the things I think is quite interesting is um, so I'm using the SB messaging adapter, and I've got it listed on one of my service bus namespaces, and I've got a queue up there called acme.bz.enrollments and one of the things that's um, interesting is I've got the Jane decoder um, which gets when the message comes in I'm basically adding a root element in the namespace so that um, it you know converts to a, an XML message that BizTalk can work with and what I think is quite interesting here is that shows that if you're you know I, I wrote a white paper a couple of years ago almost kind of saying well look um, JSON's not just a REST thing. So if you're doing service bus, really you want to be using JSON messages to keep your uh, payload size down. And often people only really think JSON as a REST thing. And I think that shows that you can use the JSON decoder with service bus, not just with the REST adapter, which I think is quite cool. And I haven't really seen that many people talking about that. So hopefully that's interesting for a few people. And now, 
so at that point, um, I guess we've you know, there's nothing particularly special about the BizTalk stuff other than the receive from service us and the open registration shows you the process. And let me just quickly check my notes that we've covered pretty much everything there. So the idea was um, next was we've got this um, this enrollment in the BizTalk and you know, we hopefully um, in the London summit, everyone was kind of really enjoying this this whole Minecraft thing going on, showed some real world type innovation behind the scenes. And what um, what we wanted to talk about next was the, the sort of how do we bring the two speed IT stuff in and some of the new offerings on the Azure app service. So um, we skip this. So we had this thing about extending the enrollment service. And um, we so we've got this architecture we've built here, and trying to sort of pitch where things like app service might fit. And we had a, a business um, scenario, just just purely for for play, really. But imagine Oliver came to me and said, "Mike, you've got this agile integration platform, and it's really cool, but I've got this requirement." And the idea is that we've enrolled that student, and we've sent them an email, and we've said, "Congratulations, we've received your enrollment." We're going to review it and you'll hear from us soon and the problem is that because the industry is getting more competitive at the moment we we're perhaps sending like a letter in the post to that student to say yes we've reviewed your application we think you you would be a great student um welcome to our course but the problem is that the post takes five days to get that letter to that student so what might happen is the student could have applied for three or four universities whoever gets back to him first might be the one he picks. So for us, um, every student that, that we make an offer to but, but doesn't end up coming to the university could be quite, a, quite an expensive customer that we've, um, that we've lost. So there's a real idea about how do we make sure we get back to the student as quick as possible to offer them a place in the course once we've made the decision that they'd be good, they would be accepted. And that to me is where, you know, to speed IT can start coming into place. So what we could say is, well, you know, Oliver says to me, Mike, you've got this agile integration platform. I need to do something quite quickly here. I can't wait X weeks or whatever. And I could say, well, look, Oliver, we've got this new stuff on us here. Maybe we can try some stuff out with that and see if we can offer a, a solution to the problem that we, you know, we might decide, well, that solution works fine. Just run with it. Or it would be a good prototype to say, yes, it's worth investing in some other way of doing it because the business idea is sound. So what we wanted to do was um, throw in um, app service where we've got a Logic app in the cloud, we've got the SQL API app, and we've got the Twilio app. And the idea here was when somebody approves the course in um, in you know in Minecraft in this instance, they approve the course the SQL API. Uh, poll in that courses database to see when an approval is made and then it'll run it through a logic app that will result in a text message going to the student and the idea is that when this when the um, applications approved the student should know within a few minutes not five days so potentially that that's a business problem you might encounter in the real world with a possible really quick way of delivering it that might have some some really solid foundation to it so the solution would look a little bit like this, where the SQL adapter would detect the change, fire it through the logic app that would send a notification out. So let's have a quick look at how we'd um, how we'd implement that. So to begin with, we've um, we've got our student. In fact, let's just um, quickly check the database to get the ID. So we know it was ID 31. I think you can just see that on the screen. So. Imagine now in Minecraft, um, I'm the sort of person who would be approving that. So I think I can go get enrollment for number 31. And I can see on the screen, I've got um, enrollment 31. It's new for Mike for course eight. So, so I can do approve enrollment for 31. And we can check the screen, and he's now approved. We can go to the database, and we should see that that's um, that's now marked as approved. Now, what will happen next is I'm hoping that everybody, if you keep my phone not too far away, 
in fact actually it's it's come through already and it didn't ding and I've normally I have my text messages on vibrate and I've tried to set the volume to be um try to set the volume to be um so it would make a noise when it came through and it didn't make a noise so I've no idea what's going on there. <laughs> Let me have a quick uh, check. I've probably left the sound off or something. I don't know. So what I'll do is I'll um I'll just show you guys. If anybody doesn't believe me, put on chat and I'll send. I'll put a picture on Twitter. Um, 2034. I've just received a text saying congratulations on enrolling for app um so your app service 101. Your enrollment status is approved. So in case anybody doesn't believe me, I'm going to put that on Twitter right now. Um, so let's see, hash, hash integration Monday. So there you go for anyone who doesn't believe me. Um, now, how did we make that happen then? So we have a look. Um, we have a look in the Zia portal. So you can see here, I've got my my few connectors um, for my Twilio stuff and my. My SQL stuff, and, and they're not really. Uh, to be honest, I find um, with this being quite new, after you've created your your um, connectors, there's, there's, they're not really that easy to see anything useful like you do when you first create them. But if you have a look at the um, the Logic app. <laughs> yeah, I'll see from the chat, you're starting to see the pictures. So, yeah, that proves it. It definitely worked. <laughs> um, so you can see I've got an enrollment notification app here. And if I have a quick look, you can see there, 8.34 p.m., it, it successfully ran. And it's not really, you know, to be honest, it's not really that complex a logic app. I just wanted to show product placement of where um, where you might use this stuff, because obviously being brand new, it would be quite a risky proposition to, to bet your entire um, integration architecture on it. But um, because it offers features that aren't really that easy to do elsewhere, the platform in certain places, it could be a really good way of doing stuff. So you can see here, I um, I've got my SQL connector. I connected to my database, and it imports in some of the um, some of the columns and stuff like that, which is, which is great. It gives me a nice, easy way to pull that database. And then after that, I use Twilio connector to send a text message to an account I've already got. Um, I've you know got the um, the Phone property flows through from the student mobile property down here, and then I'm using the concatenate function to string together, kind of see what the message is and how I'm using um, the course title from the um, from the original input from SQL. So that that's a pretty easy way to see um, see kind of what went on. And I guess um, I guess if we go back, we can probably um, We see from the troubleshooting a little bit here of some of the messages and stuff like that. Take a look at that one, I guess. So you can see, I don't know. You can see here, there's you know a little, little bit of stuff for anyone who's not familiar with the, the app service yet. You can see here some of the properties that were flowed to the um, to the API app and stuff when it was executing. So um, really, what I'm saying with the, the logic app. Was that that was a good way for us to use some of the new features in the integration platform that have been added more recently to develop a solution that was a quick win. Um, you know, when I first did that, I did that in like half an hour, something like that. Um, and the idea was that when Oliver came to me originally with a problem, I could say, well, look, here's a prototype of a solution very quickly. He could then use that to demonstrate whether that solves the business problem. And what we might say is, if it does, and we're happy. The, the constraints and the features offered by um, app service, we might just take that to production and say we're happy with it. Or we might say, well, actually, it proves the business idea, but we need a more robust solution or we need something built in a slightly different way or something more complex. So we might then have gone and built it in BizTalk instead and just pulled that that service, um, pulled that database or that system with a BizTalk adapter and then called out from BizTalk to Twilio instead or, or you know, did what else was um, was kind of involved now that was the that was the kind of core part of the demo from um, from London now what I want to do next is really have a look at um, 
the bits that I didn't show you guys. So we had this thing in this entire stack around application telemetry. And the idea here is, um, I know I've spoke to a few people about BAM in the in this newer integration world. And I'm I'm kind of, you know, a few years ago, I was a big talk um, BAM fan. Nowadays, I think um, real world integration and, you know, new types of applications have outgrown what BAM offers and BizTalk, and we need a new way of doing it. So what we um, what we wanted to do is to have the ability to have telemetry flown out of our applications that we can then start putting together in a BI capability to create a BAM solution. That means we don't have to define an activity up front because we don't necessarily know what our activities are. We might find that we've got whole new activities we didn't know existed by looking at the telemetry data. But also we have um, new types of scale that BizTalk probably isn't built to deal with. So what happens if we've got colossal numbers of requests that would just totally blow the BizTalk database away or maybe require us to spend vast amounts of money and also the ability to do quick win stuff. So the idea is that um, in in our capability, we want to create an event hub using the new Azure event hub stuff. And then on the back of that, we'll be able to use things like stream analytics, machine learning, Power BI to find some useful insights into this. And if anybody follows my blog, you'll see that a while ago I talked about this um, log for net appender that I did for event hub. So the idea is that when a message goes through the system, we can have various parts of the system would flow out with this um, log for net appender details to event hubs. And then from event hubs, we can feed into this other, other BI capability. And you know, there's other things we can do as well. I mean, potentially we could pull in tracking data and all sorts of other stuff. But what I wanted to do was just stream out our, our logging data. So we've got things going in and out of biz talk stuff going um through custom components we might flow log events from an orchestration and um i wanted to kind of just show you guys a little bit about what we've done with that so if i um if i take a little bit of a look back um maybe just the biz talk component so you can see um in here i've got my helper.info which is really just wrapping the log um, log for net stuff inside a inside a class there. So I'm logging an info event. I'm just going to um, show you guys that. Horrible if the class will come up. Come on. So you can kind of see here I've got um, setting the log for net context and then I'm just, just doing a you know a log out to that event log. Uh, sorry that event hub now under the hood in uh, the BizTalk config file, I'm more of Instructor 2. So here I've got um, connection string for the event hub, and in my log for net section, I've got a, there's a couple of different appenders, so I can log out the queues and topics if I want as well, but the main one is this um, event hub appender and I can basically log a message out it'll tell me it's biz talk it'll async log it to an event hub called log for net and um, I'll flow out a correlation ID I'll log it as JSON and um, I've just got the definition of my loggers down at the bottom which basically just pass on to that, that appender so it's really easy basic log net stuff I just happen to have this appender deploy the GAC now if I um, if I go to my Azure Service Bus stuff, um, go to my login and my event hub here, and what you'll see is that um, it, it's just really a vanilla um, vanilla log um, a vanilla event hub. But the beauty of the event hub is you can see there's been some messages going through it while we've been chatting. Now. The good thing about event hub is that I can read that stream of events in multiple different ways at the same time. So what I wanted to do is really just show the idea that one of the things I've got going on here is um, I wanted to create a feature for the ops team where we could maybe, and again, this is just prototype thinking at the minute, so I'm not saying we're definitely going to do this, but you know, the ideas are here that we might. So I've got this web job um, that runs in the background, and what this does is it uses the int, um, event processor host. Sorry guys, can you all hear me? Okay, I'm just noticing someone's saying that 
microphone's a bit off. Somebody just give me a thumbs up on chat that you can hear okay. Okay, I guess it must just be a one-off for uh, for Alexander. So, um, so we've got this web job running in the background, and basically he uses the event processor pro, uh, sorry, event processor host class that Dan Rosanova's team brought out on the service bus. And the idea here was I want to um, copy all of my events to MongoDB, and what I've got here is um, if I go back, so I guess. Um, Just to show you guys, I'm just going to clean that out and show you some new stuff going in. Um, so we just nip back to Minecraft quickly and do. Um, so we've got our courses again. Now, if I do a quick query in MongoDB and hopefully my uh, my web job should have copied those pretty much straight over. It might be a very slight delay because obviously it's all happening synchronously. But you can see here that I've got um, a bunch of records. So every component that, that that call went through logged a message. For each message it received, it logged some details. And for each message that went back out, it did. So that would have went through my relay listener and all that kind of stuff. You can see here is um, I've got some details in the event data, which um, which was a JSON serialized message which went into log for net, but also I've got some properties here. Um, so I can see I've got my, you know, it was a message in end as a correlation to an continuing ID, which is quite important if I want to string together a whole, you know, if I want to kind of do a and find all of the events that, that um, went based off one message. Um, sorry, one, I guess one business activity, I could kind of work out. Um, from that correlation ID, the whole series of events. Things like the component and the machine went on. So you can see as a as an ops person, if you've got it in something like a NoSQL database, um, you can do something like a query like this where I could, you know, put in my saved search based on continuation ID and I could just go and search and find out some events that might um might help my team troubleshoot some some issue that's going on. So that's one way that I could use it. But the other way that I could use it as well might be um, if I went to my BizTalk machine, for example. Uh, sorry, not my BizTalk, one my other machine. Um, and this is the most recent bit I've been playing around with. So I've got some stream analytics stuff going on as well. i are reading that stream. So I've got different streams, my BizTalk events and my um, API and services stack events. So we have a quick look at this one, and you can see I've got an input which is defined as being the event hub. So I can see the details of the event hub here. And I've decided that um, for the output, what I want to do is um, output Power BI. So I've got a data set named logging events. And if I um, in my query, if I click the right button there. So I've defined a very basic which just says grab all the events from that machine, which is not the BizTalk one, but the services machine, and dump them straight into Power BI, and then I can do some fancy stuff off the back of that. So if we have, um, if you imagine that the, these um, stream analytics jobs are running in the background, and what's quite cool is that means I can now build a dashboard. So here's my logging events dashboard where you can see, you know, I think it was on 100 messages processed before we started the. <laughs> Is the zombie back? Let's reload that. Um, so there's 100 messages processed before we start the um, session. You can see there's a breakdown by type of message, by um, type of component, direction of messages, by machine name, and stuff like that. Now, I'm just going to whack Minecraft open just because I think it'll be quite interesting. So if we have a look, um, yes, we'll put it down here. If we go and um, so we fetch the courses and hopefully we'll see that dashboard start changing in you know, not not far off real time when the um, when this sort of um, stream analytics job runs. We you can see it's just done. So there's a few messages went through the pipeline there, and um, 
and I see kind of see it sort of producing a fairly interactive dashboard as as your your messaging is going on. So from it, you know, we'll get back to this whole idea of how can we make an integration demo quite cool. Not only have I put Minecraft on the front end to drive it and make it make it look like something a user could understand, but at the same time we've got this ability to produce real business statistics or back of messaging that's going on in the system. And originally when I talked about this at the London summit, we just had a bit where the whole under the hood stuff was going to throw stuff at Event Hub, and we can't, we're just going to ignore it. And I hadn't done any of the Power BI stuff at that point. But then once I um, created the stream analytics jobs, um, and you know, the stream analytics job basically um, gives me this this login data set here, and I can I can create some stuff off the back of that. Um, that data set and then I can um, go and create some reports from the um, data set. So you can see I've created a report here which is how many messages, um, pie chart breaking down by component type and I just choose to add these to the dashboard which then um, you know then, then gives you this rich dashboard here. Now I mean to be fair I'm very new to Power BI, it's not something I've really used before but if someone who's very new to this in, in like a working create a dashboard like that, when you come to again demo the capabilities of, a, of an integration platform to the business, that, that's a really powerful message there. So you can imagine how well that went down at the university. Um, quick check of the list of stuff to go through. So I think we've pretty much covered everything in the demo. So I wanted to jump back um, quickly and show a couple of slides before we wrap up. Um, so we, we've got the telemetry stuff. Um, so the concerns and challenges then. So this, this is another bit that I didn't really get enough time to really go through at this summit. And one of our biggest, um, biggest challenges, I think, in this new integration world is going to be about spaghetti, AP, uh, spaghetti integration. It's quite funny because, you know, you go back 10 years and you go back five years and you go back three years and actually today spaghetti integration is the biggest challenge um i very deliberately picked the biz talk 2006 diagram that's on the screen here and changed all the protocols to be api and the reason i've done that is because i think people are kind of um you know doing this api all over the place but without this service virtualization piece um all these apis are kind of quite tightly coupled together in my opinion you know even even though it's a REST API, they, you know, you haven't really got this polymorphism that I was talking about earlier. So if I can see an API from CRM and I'm talking to it, it's not, it, you know, it's still an, a CRM API as tightly coupled as if I use their DLL. You know, the, the, the only real difference is it's over HTTP. And I think um, there's a little bit of an oversimplification going on these days where people think that API magically solves solves these problems, and I'm not convinced it does. Um, another kind of challenge we had was when do I use a new technology? So, you know, there's lots of new technology going on, and we had that um, slide earlier where I showed about how the number of technologies in the integration stack had grew exponentially over the years. And to me, when do I use a new technology is a very important question these days. And the answer to it is actually it depends, and, and you know, there's not really a black and white answer. Every organization tends to have a different opinion on how much they'll take a risk and how much they'll pay for something that delivers value. And I think I've heard different people taking different opinions on some of the, you know, if we, if we particularly talk about app service. So I've heard some people saying, well, it's, um, you know, it's brand new, we wouldn't touch it till it's a couple of years old and it's had a couple of uh, releases. Or I've heard people say, um, you know, the things like, oh, we're not, we're not, comfortable because the feature richness isn't there yet but then i've heard the exact opposite where i've heard some people go oh we want to do everything we possibly can as quickly as possible and not really figure out whether whether they might might be making a few mistakes by that so my opinion on this is don't put all of your eggs in one you need to be you need to make sure that the things you choose to use a new technology for you're quite confident with because the you know the last thing you want to do is have a project failure where the technology is viewed as being the reason it failed, because that will make a customer back off from that technology. 
so I've, not particularly with migration, but I've seen customers who had, um, you know, they, they'd sort of used um, Office 365 and they'd had a problem with the, the sort of um, Active Directory side of that. And they, they kind of then were very cautious about using um, Office 365, even though it had a lot of value for them. And I think the, the key thing here is that um, you need to make sure that people within your team are given time to do R&D and to really understand these technologies as they come out to know when's the right time to use it and also which use cases would it be good for. So in the demo, what, what I was trying to show was that there was a use case we identified where app service stroke logic app might have been a perfect fit for it, but there might have been other use cases that we just wouldn't have considered it for. So the key thing is understand where it fits, what it does, and how you would deliver a project with it. But then if it's the right fit, you know, occasionally it's good to take a risk and there can be some good rewards for doing so. Um, one of the other th things I guess that's quite important is, um, you know, we're talking about a more fragmented architecture with microservices style stuff and not one big, uh, I guess, one big bucket with everything in. So if we've got an architecture that's changing all the time, it can potentially break more often than what we'd like. Now, more often than what we like, I wouldn't necessarily say means the same as more often than what it does now, because I think there's plenty of integration platforms that make quite a lot today anyway. Um, however, when you've got these small broken down components that work, work well together, we need to have some good ALM processes to help make sure that the components we put out are reliable and work well. So to me, um, the key things are making sure your sort of build, test, deploy type um, processes and, and the way you configure and manage dependencies between applications. If you, you get those things going really well, then I think putting yourself on a good foundation to build an architecture for a constantly changing environment from a business and technical perspective. Biggest problem here is that I find most customers um, aren't really very good when it comes to biz talk with that whole ALM piece. So I guess that's a double-edged sword where there's some pros and some cons, but the key thing is if you're a customer doing integration and you're not in a good place with, with um, build, test, deploy, then you're in a bad place whatever way it comes. You need to, you need to try and address that. But you know there's some great resources out there online to tell you what good, good practices look like. You just need to appreciate that they're important and invest in them. Um, so I guess that's that's everything. Um, I I'll have a, I know there's a few chats um, questions and that come up on chat, so I'll have a quick flick through those. Um, there's also the um, the online website description, so I'll have a quick flick on there as well. But uh, please feel free to chuck any questions on if um, if anybody has any. So I hope you guys like that. I know it took a little bit longer today. Um, but I hope that was in plenty of detail for you guys, and you know, every everyone quite enjoyed it. Um, so, lots of people bigging up my speech, which I'm never gonna get tired of hearing. So, thanks for that. Um, Viva 23. I met Mark Mortimer, Guru in Microsoft, around business process automation integration. I understood with the arrival of microservices, WABs or MABs might disappear. Do you have any updates on this? So. Uh, my unofficial update would be, um, I think Mabs is already kind of merging into the new app service stuff. Um, I think where, where, to be honest, if you ever used EAI Bridges, I think you made a bad decision anyway. I've never really been a fan of that. I always quite liked EDI stuff on Azure, um, but unfortunately, I've never had the chance to use it in a real project, but it seemed quite cool. Um, hybrid connections was something I've used a bit in that's migrating to the new stuff but I think the best thing to do on that question there is um, Wednesday night this week we've got another integration Monday but it's on a Wednesday um, session at the same time with Josh Twist who's just taken over as um, lead for the integration practice he, he replaces Vivek who's um, I guess Mark and Guru's boss so Josh is going to come on and do it and basically introduce himself and do a Q&A with people so if you um if you want to pop on on Wednesday night, that Josh will give you the official update on that, I guess. Um, so Carlo, that reminds me of the MSC. 
Yeah, I guess um, conceptually, I mean, MSC to me was um, was quite a cool little thing at the time, but it didn't really get a lot of traction. But this whole service virtualization piece, I think, um, it, you know, to me, it's quite important in the architecture. And as I say, we, we've got a lightweight component that we may open source at some point, which was like a really naughty way of doing it. But um, strategically, we'll be looking towards Sentinet um, as, as our way of doing that. And big fan of Sentinet. Um, if people are interested, I think we can get um, Anne from Sentinet to do a session on integration Monday at some point. Um, or perhaps Steve Jan, because he's used it quite a lot. But uh, yeah, Sentinet's a great product, and it just gives you a way of um, creating virtual endpoints that map to physical endpoints, both REST and um, WCF stuff. Uh, wow, Salam's still using the latest version of MSE. I didn't know there was a latest version, but uh, yeah, it'd be, be interesting to hear how you get on with that. Uh, Carlo, drop a file in the folder and watch it disappear. <laughs> yeah, that's the whole point, mate. Um, so hopefully, hopefully I've shown you guys that Minecraft's quite easy to get started with. And um, yeah, just look, at, you know, the, to me, the, the best thing is that you're in a room full of people who usually have kids. And if they've got kids aged anywhere between five and 16, they're going to be playing Minecraft. So if you go in and show them Minecraft, you know, you get like what happened at the summit where on Monday night, everyone had been speaking to their kids. And the kids said, right, on Tuesday, you've got to go and speak to Mike and find out what he did about Minecraft. So you know, it's all about creating creating an interest. And, um, you know, it's difficult to do that in integration, but I thought that worked quite well. Uh, Salam, I have an issue with one of my customers' platforms. He has an Azure website, 9WF CF service that many talk to, Azure App Fabric. This is an open question. Are you a good idea? Change this architecture to microservices as we suffer from issues for app fabric um um by microservices i assume from my talk you mean the architecture style um so i guess it can be quite awkward to break apart your your traditional wcf or rest services is what i find um so what the reason we pick microservices is because we can encapsulate the logic more effectively which makes it easy to move it so in theory i could move a service from being Today, it could be implemented as a, a WCF IS type thing. Tomorrow, I could move it into BizTalk because I needed some durability. And the idea is that nobody would know, while the person who implemented the service, the consumer would really just get similar experience. And, and that, that's kind of the whole point, is to, to have this agility behind the scenes because we've got a generic on-ramp, off-ramp type interface. Um, so everybody trusted me the picture on Twitter, which is great. I definitely didn't have that prepared earlier. Um, it's a shame about the ringtone. Uh, so, yep, Salam agrees about doing the build and test stuff. Um, so, unit tests and orchestrations, yeah. So, that's a big question. I guess um, my answer to anything to do with testing around BizTalk is um, it, look at behavior-driven development type testing with um, spec flow and personally I tend not to try and test the orchestrations in isolation just because nobody ever really had a great way of doing it in isolation but I think um, our BDD stuff was it worked really well for us and was effective uh, so blah, blah, blah. thanks everybody's uh, saying they liked it um, okay so somebody says Sentinel it only supports Silverlight which Chrome doesn't support so I think I had it running in Chrome there, but maybe I didn't. Um, but I'll, I'll pass that feedback on to um, to Andrew. Um, and I don't think we've got any questions on the... No, great. So um, I guess if, if nobody else has any questions, thank you very much, everyone, for listening to me. Um, I'm, I'm glad... Um, I'm glad the session came across quite well because it was really just a make it up as we go along kind of thing, with it being quite short notice rather than it being properly prepared. <laughs> but um, yeah, just to, so just to reiterate for um, for Wednesday night, the link for Josh's session, which I'll just stick on the chat. Um, so I'm hoping we can get quite a few people here because Josh was um, Josh was unable to, to make um, the Integrate Summit and 
in my opinion, Josh is going to be really great for the integration community, um, product lead for biz talk and integration. So if you don't know Josh, he came from API management and hopefully um, Wednesday session should be really great. And, um, you know, chuck your questions on the, so I'll get that link as well. If you've got any questions for Wednesday, um, chuck them on here. But otherwise, yeah, thanks for thanks everyone. And if um, anyone wants to know more about any of this stuff, just ping me an email or something, and I'll I'll share some stuff. But cheers, everyone.